Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Michael Oliver. Um, he's a kind of a security blanket for me because as an investor, he bolsters my con- confidence, certainly that uh, in the longer term, on, that I'm on the right side of the markets. And I, I just mentioned uh, in the introduction to today's show uh, that I treasure Michael for his, uh, for his longer term perspective, but Michael left me know that he's pretty good in the short term, too. Now, I, I, I don't know that because I don't look for the short term. I'm not a trader. I don't particularly look for help from Michael on the short term. Uh, but, but welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining me again. Oh, great to be back. Good. Now, Michael, you were just telling me you, uh, you, know, you, you do make some pretty good short-term calls as well. You were just telling me you did one on the S&P, I guess, right? Well, I, the, I don't usually focus on that, but I know everybody is so hyper about the S&P right now. It's, it's the yeah. main market of hyperness, okay? Uh, <laughs> either you're bullish or bearish. And it, right now we're trading 2080. In late 2014, we, oh, in 2014 we had a price high at 2093. Wow. Okay. Does that tell you something? Okay. Now, the, the mistake most traders or investors are making is they're looking at the S&P and the Dow and the S&P 100, which is like a subset of the 500. They're all blue-chip U.S. indices. They're in their own world. They don't look, smell, act like anything else, including most sectors within the U.S. do not look like the S&P looks. The DAX index in Germany does not look like the S&P. Uh, certainly the Italian index, the French uh, uh, Nikkei 225 in Japan, they look like disasters in the making, or already disasters. Whereas we're sitting up here uh, sunning ourselves sideways for two years now. Oh. Uh, no doubt central banks are helping that. This is the Fed, to some extent, has is, is fostered this sense of safety. But it's peeling away uh, in terms of developed market stock action. It's peeling away, and it's, you're left with nothing but blue-chip U.S. stocks. is about the only thing still standing. Certainly small caps are not. If you look at the Russell 2000. So when people say, what is the market doing, they look at the S&P and they're making a mistake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it will certainly, uh, yeah, if you just look at the S&P 500, you say, what well, we're, you know, all these doomsayers, uh, David Stockman and others that we've had on this show continue to say, uh, you know, the economy is going to hell, the markets are in bad shape. Uh, and yet you look around and you say, well, geez, you know, here I'm looking at the market today, the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ, all up over 1%. We're looking at a 1.1% rise in the S&P to 2081 right now. But as you say, that's that's even below where it was back at the peak in 2014. So we've really gone nowhere, and yet the perception oh, is no. that things are pretty good. Mm-hmm. So, well, but NASDAQ he, uh, 100, for example, which is a blue chip index, NASDAQ 100, yeah. it's down 5% on the year. Yeah, well, S&P's 5% like already on this year, year yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's it's that kind well, of thing yeah. you've got to look at and be aware of. Yeah, a few big stocks. It reminds me a little bit, Michael, and I think you you and I are old enough to maybe remember the 1970s when, in fact, it was just a handful of stocks that really kept the markets from from really tanking for a while, and uh, that for seems to be the case. Well, you know what you're saying. I think I think you know you you do have some very colorful. Interesting language you called. You referred to the stock market as dead man walking last week. What is it then? It's really your momentum stuff that's that's very very important. That and it, and what I would like to tell my listeners is that when you subscribe to Michael, essentially it's you know you hear his sort of his views right here on this show. But when you subscribe to Michael, you're going to see the charts uh, that give you the confidence that uh, allow you to understand that the momentum. And the structure is changing. And you don't see it in the price a lot of times, but you see it, Michael sees it in the structure that he passes along. And that's, that's most helpful. But you're really seeing a breakdown in the structure of the S&P 500, right? Oh, it's, yeah, it is fully as broken as it can get. Now, I will say this, at, at, the, at the top of 2000, you had a similar situation. You hung around for almost a year before you fell apart. It didn't uh-huh. really go up, just beat your chest. Uh, 2007 was a distribution top. You didn't break down until the first quarter of 2008. And even then, you came back up in May of 2008, almost unchanged on the year, as if you were going to go somewhere. And then you rolled over and fell apart. So a lot of these tops, especially in stocks, uh, the momentum, will, annual momentum and quarterly momentum, which is a long-term metric, will fall apart visibly in front of you when you plot it on a chart. And the price will, will resist it up mm-hmm. to a point. And uh, this one is... is particularly protracted. Now, a lot of other indices throughout the world, developed markets, not talking emerging, uh, have fallen apart, even on the price charts. 
So mm-hmm. now, I fit this also with, you don't just look at stocks, you have to look at the relationships, asset mm-hmm. class relationships, and the commodities are clearly uh, firming, uh, and I think they're going to be much stronger in the next six to nine months than most analysts or even commodity specialists can fantasize, uh, and have a double-digit percent gains of size in many of these markets. Oil, soybeans are up 50 cents today. Uh, mm. Uh, things like that. These are all broken out over quarterly momentum structures, in some cases annual, and therefore there's an ambush underway in the commodity category. Well, that has to be fitted into, well, what does that mean for stocks? Well, they like inflation, they claim, but they're not going to like it if it affects the bond markets. Right. And I'm starting to see some yield evidence that it's uh, that the bond markets, particularly in Italy, is my prime focus right now. I think Italy is the next Greece, and if it is, wow. it's, it, it, you will not live through it. <laughs> you, you can't dismiss Italy, and I'm watching its yield situation very closely, and it looks very ripe for a major rise in yields, which means the ECB has lost control. Wow. Uh, that one well, event alone uh, can swamp the stock market. Including well, Michael, uh, that, that, that might actually be bullish, though, for at least in the short term for U.S. Treasuries, right? I mean, uh, there was a, yes. as I say, the, the, the flight to, right. to, uh, to safety. Yes, that flight to safety could... I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the long end of the debt market, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, and the U.S., the three, quote, safe long-term debt markets, uh, where there's a little bit of yield, like, you know, uh, 30-year Treasury has more yield than, well, the Japan's a negative, but uh, you, yes. you get my point. Still, it's a flight to safety phenomenon when they stay firm. But I think that's going to reverse, and I think the bond market's going to join the stock market on the downside, meaning rise, uh, lower prices in bonds, higher yields. And I think that break will occur this year, probably later in the year, uh, at which point wow. the rising rates is going to be the, a fundamental factor. So, Michael, are you suggesting possibly that we could see an end to this most phenomenal bull market in my lifetime, one that started in U.S. Treasuries in Ronald Reagan's days? You know, when we had 17% rates and all the way down to where we are now. What a bull market. I mean, you could have made more money in bonds than stocks. Uh, Michael O'Higgins, who I, who I met up with some years ago, beating the Dow with bonds, demonstrated how you could have made far more money by being most of the time in bonds, some of the times in stocks, depending on the Dow's, Dow, the, the dogs of the Dow, he used as a trade-off in certain conditions. Uh, are you suggesting that this phenomenal bull market in U.S. Treasuries could be nearing an end? Yes. Yeah, I, I see it in the technicals, and I'm talking the safe stuff, not high yield. We know high yield has come into trouble this past year and the year before. Uh, I'm talking about the safe stuff that's still going up, 30-year bonds, to 10-year notes, and so forth. Uh, that's where the real danger is because it's very crowded. Uh, because well, a lot of the other debt instruments have been shaken and therefore, people in the high yield market have moved where? Okay, I answer the question. It, it, in the, the safer stuff, and that means it's crowded. The central banks mm-hmm. have created the situation, and mm-hmm. I see the technicals ripe for the un, un, unwinding of this process. Well, you know, when when I think of your plate tectonics, as you you know, as a as a student of geology, plate tectonics is a very meaningful expression to me. It's gigantic. It's monstrous. It's something that's continental or something that's just big big picture i can't think of any market that is that is a greater continental shift or tectonic shift than the treasury markets the us treasury markets and if you're telling me uh if you're suggesting that we may be nearing the end of this phenomenal bull market in treasuries then i think it's earth shattering almost yeah i i think so too and uh, i think that it's a it's an asset class shift that will cause all kinds of repercussions it will not occur in, in isolation uh-huh. Now, the flight to safety, of course, it's been to the dollar, to the treasuries. We are seeing, I would argue, to a certain extent, a flight to safety to gold. Correct. Um, you, we're seeing a bit of a pullback this week, uh, so far this week in gold. I'm not sure. I haven't seen shortly before airtime here. It was still down a bit on the day, and yesterday was down quite a bit. We had touched actually 1,300, I think, intraday uh, in, the, in, the, in the near-term contract. Um, w- you're still, I mean, there's no reason not to be bullish on gold from your perspective at this no, stage? No, no reason at all unless you're a day trader or a three-day uh-huh. trader. <laughs> you know, admittedly, <laughs> you could have these 30, 40-point pullbacks, 50 points, 60 points, whatever. In fact, in February, in the first surge, we ran the 1260 
from the middle 1100s who did it in a heartbeat because we broke through annual momentum breakout structures and you had a hundred plus dollar surge. Well, within 48 hours of having hit that 1260, you actually traded back down to 1192. Mm -hmm. Then quickly mm -hmm. went back up into the mid 1200s again. So there have been a lot of these breaks, but I think they're all congestive action breaks. I do not think this rally is even. I don't think we're at the risk of a significant correction yet. I think if mm -hmm. that's going to come, we're going to blow out the high price of last year. Now, if you'll notice, since 2011, every year has produced a lower price high in gold. Well, some, somebody noticed that. Last year's price high was 1307. And as you noted, we traded up on the nearby active contract last week to 1306. Mm -hmm. Wow. Somebody sold one dollar in front of last year's price size, if that's some great technical wisdom. And we back <laughs> off some, and if, if you scalp his, his, uh, his short trade, he's doing okay. But if he's uh, resting on his laurels, assuming we're not going to go through there, because annual momentum has taken out the highest, the highest readings of 2015, 2014, and half of 2013 already, and momentum usually leads price. So I'm thinking that that sale at 1306 was a hint of what's to come. We're going through there, and when we go through, I think there'll be a rush, another rush in gold. Now, that yeah. rush, you might be at a point after that for some kind of tradable pullback. Mm -hmm. But from here, I think that it's a frustrated process for the shorts. All right. Well, you've, you've been talking about 1450 or so as the first serious yes. resistance level. That's still what you see? That's when you're likely to That's see something in that area? Level, but I think between here and there, there could be a jiggle of a of, of, of more corrective jiggle, like a $60, $70 pullback. Uh, that'd probably be quick. Similarly, on oil, for example, I think oil has a very good chance of seeing something near $60 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, right now at 44, 45 area, that doesn't seem like a big leap, but I was saying that back when we were in the 30s. Yes. Now, <clears throat> I think oil could have a good little $6 pullback, which it hasn't had in quite a while, up around the $50 level. We haven't gotten there yet. Our high has been 46 and change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, that, for example, you could get a stumble there. Now, that's not the top of the rally, but I think it's like a midpoint stumble in the process of getting to 40, uh, to 60. Similarly, in the process of getting to 14, 50, Gold, that's an area of uh, some predictable resistance, I believe. You could get a stumble maybe in the mid-1300s. But again, mm -hmm. these aren't trend changers. These are, the kind of, these are corrective processes when they occur. Sure. Uh, the Michael, we, we've got only uh, less than a minute left here yet. Uh, I noticed you did a little bit of work recently on the dollar. Since the commodities seem to be so correlated with the dollar, negatively correlated or positively, cor you know, negatively correlated mm -hmm. with the dollar. Uh, what is your outlook for the dollar and the euro? How is the dollar looking now? We're seeing a bit more strength the last few days, up to point ninety four or so on the index. W what are your thoughts on the dollar, uh, just for the last 30 is, seconds? It's a, I, I tend to think it's a bit what you call a bear market rally. We got the 92, took out last year's price lows. And maybe you get up to 95, which is like another 75 basis points above where you are now. But I think it's a rally to be sold, not a rally to believe in. Uh, similarly, the euro, watch it closely. It's nestling around 114. I think if you close out any week up there around one, if you look at a price chart even, there's a flat crew cut at around 115. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're selling. It's traded right. up above there, but it won't close a week out above there. And I think that's the key for the euro. If it breaks out, or right. it goes down. All right, we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much again, Michael, for being with us and sharing your wisdom. 